At this time of year in many churches throughout our land, there are thanksgiving services. Although for the reasons that we know very well, in many churches, those uh, activities have not been able to be held as usual. And I have to confess that for many, many years in France, the idea of having a Thanksgiving service never, ever crossed my mind. Thanksgiving was an American thing. It was something that the Americans did. And in fact, for them, it is Thursday, 26th of November, another fortnight. And we trust that because of the events of this present week, that indeed they will have real cause for Thanksgiving. And of course, in the Bible, there is a long history of Thanksgiving events. The Israelites had various festivals, one of which was the Feast of Harvest that we find mentioned in Exodus 23. And when they entered the Promised Land, but even earlier, during their wanderings in the desert, God called them to thankfulness for all his provision for all their needs, both physical and spiritual. And so I want us this evening to consider a passage in the Old Testament. Perhaps it isn't one of the best known passages, but it deserves to be better known. It is Isaiah chapter 12. So let us read together this little short chapter. Isaiah chapter 12 and reading all six verses. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known on all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Amen. Sometimes the layout of chapters in our Bible doesn't always help us to understand the great themes that the writer is dealing with. Isaiah didn't write in chapters. He wrote in long sections. And this chapter 12 is the closing portion of a section that began in Isaiah chapter 6. Do you remember there in that chapter, Isaiah had this wonderful and glorious vision of the holiness of God. And through that vision, he came to a greater understanding of his own sinfulness. Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. But an angel comes from the altar and touches his mouth, and a sin is atoned for. And then in chapter 7, Isaiah receives that wonderful announcement that a virgin will conceive and bear a son whose name will be Emmanuel. And again in chapter 9, he sees the coming of that son and how the government would be upon his shoulder and he would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then in chapter 11, he sees the spirit of wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and fear resting upon him, and the earth being full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. There are many, many other things that we could underline in those chapters. Many other things about the Lord Jesus to be found there. But this 12th chapter then is a wonderful climax of praise and thanksgiving for all of those wonderful and glorious truths. Let us then look at this Isaiah chapter 12. And we see, first of all, a personal testimony. 
a personal testimony. Verse 1, you will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. And yes, Isaiah is speaking for himself, but he's also projecting forward to a future day. If you're looking for something to do this evening at home, you could skim through this whole book of Isaiah and see the number of times that Isaiah uses that little expression on that day. On that day. He is referring to the coming of Christ and all the days thereafter. And so, friends, the question is so obvious to each one of us this evening. Have you thanked the Lord today for all his blessings to you, for all of his material blessings, for all of his family blessings, and especially for all of his spiritual blessings? And I wonder how many times recently, as you have sought to thank the Lord, have you burst into song? In verse 2, we read, The Lord is my strength and my song. Sometimes in the past, I have been accused of leading people astray when I sing. And yes, I have to confess that that has been sometimes true. But I suggest that a person who sings is a joyful, warm, outgoing person. Do friends, neighbors, work colleagues know you as someone who is always thankful, always appreciative, and who is especially ready to acknowledge how good God has been to you? We all have different habits regarding TV channels, radio stations that we listen to. In France, for many years, we always listened to BBC Radio 4 to get news in English. And we have continued that as our habit at home. And every morning in the Today program, there's always a thought for the day. Little spiritual item. And when it's a Christian speaker... Often the person is trying to relate to society and the needs of listeners. And the speaker will say, in this period of lockdown, in this period of difficulty, God is good for those who are lonely. God can help those who have a particular need. And yes, that is true. And we give thanks that God is there for the lonely person. But Isaiah doesn't say that God simply improved his quality of life. No, he says, though you are angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Why was God angry with Isaiah? Because as he discovered in chapter 6, he was a sinner like every other human being. And that sinner uh, and that condition of sin attracts the wrath of God. If we never speak of sin, if we never, never speak of God's wrath and anger, our gospel is false. But you remember that picture in chapter 6. Thanks to the embers taken from the altar, Isaiah's fault was removed and his sin atoned for. And much later in the book, he and we will be led to see how that will come about. A man would be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. And here in this chapter, Isaiah states that all who've had a real personal experience, a real personal encounter with this Messiah, whom we know to be Jesus, could have such a testimony. I will give thanks to you, O Lord. This is the God of my salvation. It is always personal. Always personal. And yet there's something interesting in the text here that isn't at all obvious in English. And perhaps some of you are really courageous this evening and at other times, and you choose to read your Bible in French. 
And so you will see something rather interesting. Because in the opening verse, it is two, you singular. But in verses three and four, it is vu, you plural. And one commentator writes, to enter into salvation is a personal experience, but to enjoy it, it is communal. When we have personally experienced salvation, we have become members of a global family, a family that we didn't belong to before. It's like marriage. We join another family. We belong to a wider family circle. And of course, that spiritual family one day will all be together, gather together in one place before the throne of God and the throne of the Lamb. But obviously here and now upon earth, it is quite impossible that all of God's people could be together in one place. And so God in his wisdom has been pleased to place this global family in local units, in local branches of the church. And so friends, we have to ask the question, are we thankful for this place, this meeting place, this group of people who meet together here in Lisburn for the work that goes on here? A family is a place for talking together. A family is a place for sharing. Do we share together what we've been learning from God's word? Do we share together the tokens we have experienced of God's love and grace? Are we encouraging one another? A personal testimony. But then secondly, we see a real confidence. A real confidence. We're all living in the most unusual and uncertain times. And no doubt, we have many questions about, about what the future holds for each one of us. D.L. Moody, the famous American evangelist, at the end of the 19th century was in conversation with a lady. And she confided to him that she had many fears, but that she had discovered a Bible verse that helped her in those moments. It was Psalm 56, verse 3. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. However, Moody told her that there was an even better verse, Isaiah 12, verse 2. Behold the God of my salvation, I will trust and will not be afraid. I will trust and will not be afraid. If only each one of us had that same trust, how wonderfully our lives would be transformed. Yes, we must teach our children that some things are dangerous. Electricity roads, certain products. And so, yes, there has to be a certain fear of some things. And similarly, throughout the Bible, we are reminded often that there's a need for a respectful fear of God. <clears throat> In the book of Proverbs, there are sentences like these, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. He who fears the Lord has great confidence. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. But yet more than 300 times in the Bible, <clears throat> there is the expression, fear not, or something similar. Some are well known. Peter looked at the waves. <clears throat> the spies sent out by Joshua to the promised land, they saw giants. In both cases, they didn't fix their eyes upon Jesus they didn't fix their eyes upon God's promises. They were afraid. This is the lesson here of verse 2. Yes, the future is uncertain. The Christian is in the world, and we must undergo the same trials as other people. But our center of gravity is elsewhere. We are citizens of heaven. And we know that our great king is looking after us. The Lord is my strength and my song, says Isaiah. Or Paul says in Romans 8, 
I know that all things work together for the good of those who love God. In this book, Isaiah has tried chapter after chapter to show his countrymen that they should put all their trust in God and have confidence in him. How much more should we, since the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom we now know to be King of Kings and Lord of Lords? A real confidence. And then thirdly, let us see an abundant provision. In verse 3, Isaiah writes, With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And here he is drawing parallels with the Israelites after their exit from Egypt. In the wilderness, God provided them with water, either from the rock or from springs of abundant water in places like Elam. If we are in Christ, we are no longer in a spiritual desert. In him, the springs are even more numerous. And this picture of water in abundance is found everywhere in Scripture. In Psalm 1, the man who is blessed is like a tree planted by streams of water. In Psalm 23, he leads me beside still waters. Or staying in Isaiah, Isaiah 55. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And that invitation in Isaiah reminds us of Jesus' own words to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. And there he says, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And in John 7, 30, verses 37 and 38, the invitation of Jesus is similar. And there John spells out that this living water is in fact the Holy Spirit. Jesus gives and pours out the Spirit upon those who are his children. And so all that ties in with those little words we know so well from Psalm 23. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. The abundance of blessings that come from the Lord Jesus. Alas, today many in our modern society seek contentment and joy in many, many other things. And alas, that is often true for those who call themselves Christians. And the spiritual climate in Isaiah's day wasn't that much different from our own. He often had to rebuke his hearers. And one of his successors, Jeremiah, had to do the same. Jeremiah 2 verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. As we saw earlier, the you here is plural. It is the people of God together drawing from these wells. Over these past weeks and months, because of the lockdown and all of these things, perhaps some of us have become used to meeting for church online as we're doing now. At home, we may have an abundance of books. We have an abundance of perhaps other spiritual aids. And we think, well, why do I need to go to church? Why do I go, need to go to these meetings with other people? But that which we call generally the means of grace are not private and personal, but they are practiced within the church. Yes, of course, I can. I must read my Bible. I must pray in my own home. But for many Christians, up until about a, a century ago, the place of public worship was the only place where they could hear God's word. 
They were not able to read for themselves, and so they couldn't read their Bible at home. They had to come to church, and that was the place of instruction. That was the place of prayer. That was the place of sharing. That was the place where God's Spirit was poured out. That's the place where people could say their cup overflows. Okay, perhaps with modern means and devices, we can say, yes, there are blessings at home and blessings in the public place. The two go hand in hand. But if we're not drinking from the springs during the week in our own home, on Sundays, Christ is distant. Worship is boring. So in the morning and evening at home, will we draw joyfully from the springs of living water? Is there a determination to make better use of public meetings, the public gatherings of God's people? An abundant provision. And then lastly, some simple resolutions. In verses 4 to 6, we have a succession of imperatives. And they're all in the plural, except the last one, which is feminine singular. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion. It isn't that women need to be encouraged more than others. In fact, the opposite is often true. But Isaiah simply stresses that all without exception should proclaim around them what the Lord has done and is doing in their lives. In a sense, that was his own experience in Isaiah 6. After he'd been cleansed of his sin, he had to go and tell it to others. So let us look then at these imperatives in verses 4 and 6. The most space is given to praise. Verses 5 and 6. Sing praises to the Lord. Shout and sing for joy. I've just finished reading a certain book. And in one place there was this quotation, very striking quotation from Martin Luther. Only a new man can sing a new song. A person cannot praise God unless he understands that there is nothing in himself worthy of praise. And then this from John Calvin in the same book. Praise constitutes the chief exercise of godliness in which God would have us to be engaged in during the whole of our life. Challenging words from those two great reformers. But listen to this from John Piper, an American Baptist pastor who is still alive. Words that I personally found very, very challenging. He writes this, The ultimate goal of the church is not mission, but worship. Mission exists because worship doesn't. Missionary and evangelistic activity is a temporary activity. I, who have been known as a missionary for many years, but that's only a temporary work. The permanent work is the work of praise and worship. Worship remains forever. And yes, of course, our worship and praise is directed toward God, but it can also be a powerful testimony and a means of witness and instruction to others around us. We're to praise, but we're also to witness all of us. Verses 4 and 5, make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Let this be made known in all the earth. Why should we do this? For the, exactly the same reasons that we praise him. Because of his wonderful name. Because he has done wonderful things. Because God is not some far off distant deity. The son of God, Jesus, became one of us. In taking a human nature 
exactly like ours. He came to do what we couldn't do for ourselves. Die on a cross in order to reconcile us with God. Turn away that anger of God against our sin that we might know him as our God and our Savior. Yes, we're to witness, all of us. And then we must pray. Verse 4, call upon his name. If we want others to come to the Lord, we must pray for that. If we were to go into any of the local supermarkets and go to the aisle where all of the various drinks are to be found, there's all kinds of bottles with the, the word cola on it. All kinds of things call themselves cola. But those who make Coca-Cola say that there's a special product in Coca-Cola that makes it different and makes it better, gives it that special taste. Now, I'm not being sponsored by Coca-Cola at all. But let's simply say that in the life of a Christian, in Christian witness, there is no secret ingredient. All of us are called to praise. All of us are called to witness. And all of us are called to pray. To pray that people will come to know God and come to know Jesus. We end our meditation as we began it. The imperative of verse 4. Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. We began our service by reading a few verses from the book of Revelation. And if we were to consider various chapters in that book, we would find that time and time again, we have these pictures of the people of God in glory, continually giving thanks, continually worshiping and thanking God for his goodness and grace. And friends, if we are hoping to be there one day, perhaps we should be beginning those habits and practices here upon earth, those habits which come so naturally and abundantly on high. We should be doing those things now here upon earth. Isaiah was already a prophet before the events of these chapters. And in a sense, what happened to him in chapter 6, to use our modern language, we might almost say it was like a second conversion experience. It was a deeper work of grace in his life. Perhaps that is what many of us need. Our spiritual lives are shallow. We become satisfied with a certain level, certain knowledge of God's word. We go through a certain routine. But our experience of God, our experience of the Lord Jesus... Our experience of salvation is not growing and becoming deeper and deeper. We need a second experience. Or perhaps some of us need a first conversion experience. Perhaps this evening you think that you are living quite a good life. Everything is okay. But no, not at all. Even if you're only guilty of one single little sin that calls out God's wrath and God's anger, such is his holiness. And in fact, in all of our lives, there are many, many sins. How we should be thankful then that God sent his son born of a virgin, a son who was punished at Calvary in the place of sinners like you and like me. Yes, we need to thank God. Thank God every single day for what he's done for us in the Lord Jesus. 
this little chapter of Isaiah, a lovely chapter, a chapter that calls us to examine our lives. Are we truly thankful? Are we experience, experiencing those abundant blessings? Are we praying? Let's just read the chapter again as we close. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. For though you are angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust I will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Amen.